Hi, John. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. Hi, yeah. Uh, we've known each other a long time. We have a lot of areas of shared concern. So uh, this is very far from the first time we've talked together. But today we're going to talk about something which um, you particularly feel very concerned about, as do I, and we both have for many years, and it's about the practice of ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, which in England is still given to between two and a half thousand and three thousand people a year. A lot of people think it's died out. It hasn't. And recently you've been involved in a yet another iteration of, you know, a number of campaigns about ECT that kind of rise and fall and rise and fall and haven't yet got us quite where we want to be, but things are looking more hopeful. So I'd like to ask you a bit about that. And before that, I'd like to just ask you a bit about how you first came to be concerned about the practice of ECT in your career. Ah, oh, well, the very first time I came across this whole idea of putting electricity through people's brains was in New York when I was a 21-year-old a nursing attendant um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a psych hospital there. And uh, I knew nothing about it. And I just noticed every Monday, Wednesday and Friday afternoon, this little a row of people, and it was always older women, sort of sat in the corridor and then disappeared one by one into this room. Half of them were sitting there really passive, passively with sort of resigned look on their faces and the other half were terrified and occasionally one or two would make a run for it and so I was just could not understand what was going on. So eventually of course I found out that they were, they were waiting for electroconvulsive therapy so I was fascinated and horrified at the same time and, and volunteered to sort of help because I wanted to find out about it so it became my job to sit with them as they recovered from the from the from mm. being unconscious and from having that amount of electricity go through their heads and they would not know who they were they would not know where they were and the most painful question after they slowly came back to reality the, the most painful question was well why would they do something like that mm. to me mm. and I I had no answer so that was the, that was the very first time um, I knew nothing about the research at, at that point. Right. Um, so yeah, I've been fascinated, I guess, ever since about why people would possibly think it's a good idea to cause grand mal seizures in people when one branch of medicine is trying to sort of cure seizure disorders. Well, sometimes the naive questions are the most important ones, aren't they? So right from the start, there's something seemed very strange to you about that. and. You said at the time you didn't know anything about the research and of course the research says all sorts of different things but you yourself have produced a lot of the research haven't you since those early days and you've recently produced a, a review of the evidence that's caused quite a stir can you tell us what what those conclusions were from that recent review? yeah yeah i've done quite a few over the years this year uh, uh, starting in 2004 actually goodness um and, and all of the reviews find no evidence that ECT is any better than placebo. And just to quickly explain it, in relation to ECT, a placebo is when you give the um, general anaesthetic, but you withhold the electricity and the convulsion, as, as, as you know. But some people might not quite grasp what a placebo is in this situation. So in those studies, um, and the interesting thing is really is that there hasn't been one of those studies since 1986. Mm. So that's 35 years nearly, with no studies uh, comparing it to see whether ECT actually is effective. So those 11 studies that, that there were before then, none of them have any evidence that it, it's better than placebo during treatment. Um, well, that's not fair. Four of the 11 show a slight difference for about a third of people, and it's temporary. Um, so there's no studies showing that beyond the end of treatment, because this is what I mean by that is, is a serious, you know, there's an average of 10 shocks in a, in a course of treatments, as you know. Um, and there's no study showing that after that last shock, there is any benefit whatsoever compared to placebo. But what was different about this last review that we published in June was that usually the response is, oh, well, you must be biased, John, because all the meta-analyses always say ECT is safe and effective. Um, so I thought it was about time we, we looked at the meta-analyses. Mm. Um, and so that's what, that's what we did. And I did that with Professor Irving Kirsch uh, from Harvard Medical School, who is probably the world's leading expert on placebo effects in, um, in psychiatry. 
Um, and we figured out how it was that they came to these conclusions um, about it being safe and effective. They paid no attention whatsoever to the quality of the 11 studies. Mm -hmm. uh, it was quite, quite bizarre. Um, they included between one and seven of the studies, so it's completely arbitrary which studies they, they, they picked. Um, but there was, there was no uh, focus on whether the studies were of any quality or not. And none of the meta-analyses found any studies showing that ECT had any long-term benefits. And none of them found any benefits, any studies, showing that it saves lives. And as you all know, that is one of the biggest claims repeatedly made about electroshock therapy. That yes, it can you know, and prevent suicide. Yeah. That's right. You know, even even those that admit that it does cause some brain damage, we'll probably come on to that. Um, so yes, but it's a price worth paying because at least it keeps people alive. And they've been saying that now for 80 years. And after 80 years, you'd think you'd come up with one study mm. to support that myth, but they don't. The, 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 the people who believe in it, and they genuinely believe in it, and they're caring people, they, gen they just know it works. And the evidence just doesn't matter. It's interesting in this era of evidence-based practice, sometimes yeah. we the evidence, it actually isn't there. And in the end, what people are saying is, in effect, it's a matter of faith. You know, if you challenge people, they say, I've seen people it works on. Sure. sure. You and uh, along with another very senior researcher have found actually no hard evidence at all for its effectiveness, which is, of course, extremely concerning, given there is also reason to believe it can be not only not helpful, but damaging. But yes. there are other problems which we've been talking about haven't we, recently. It's, it's not just about the lack of evidence, it's about the way it's given. So you might reasonably have concerns about it, even if you felt you had a place, even if you felt ECT had a place. Do you want to say something about the other concerns about how it's practiced? Yes, but just 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 quickly to elaborate, just briefly on on the damage because it's important this cost benefit uh, analysis. I mean, it has no benefit, <laughs> um, but uh, which wouldn't matter if it was all placebo effects. It wouldn't matter if there was no damage. So just ever so quickly. The studies um, that have been done show that between 12% and 55% of people do end up with permanent memory loss. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, uh, that is an awful lot of people. Uh, and then there's a small but significant risk of death also. So we just need to state, state that. Now, in terms of um, uh, how it's been administered, um, the rather sad you, thing you did an audit didn't you you and some yes. yeah yeah we did we did an audit um three or four years ago and the, and the problem with how it's been administered is of course it's monitored by um what's called the ect accreditation service ectas which is run by surprise surprise the royal college of psychiatrists which is a little bit like having a fox watching the chicken coop really um it's, this, is, this can hardly be called an independent process when you've got the same profession that's administering this very dangerous procedure monitoring it. Um, so when we did our independent audit of it, we found a, a lot of um, breaches uh, in terms of how well it was being monitored. Um, the, the major way for monitoring the adverse effects is um, simply having the psychiatrist administering it record whether or not there was any cognitive um, dysfunction. No tests were being used in most of the um, uh, units, no proper batteries of cognitive assessment. Um, it's absolutely irresponsible with, with a procedure this dangerous not to be monitoring it. Mm -hmm. And then about the, lots of other breaches about consent, um, quite a number of trusts were breaking, actually breaking the law in the Mental Health Act in terms of um, getting second opinions around um, when people ref try to refuse it. There is a clear set of, uh, it's a clear legislation about what you have to do and, uh, and who can give uh, second opinions. Because 40% of people, about 40%, as you'll know, Lucy, are getting this against their will. Mm. So here you've got a, a treatment that is marginally effective at best, causes brain damage in up to half of, half of people getting it, and somebody can say, I don't want this, and they can be given it against their will. Yeah. What branch of medicine um, 
real you know, uh, other branch of medicine is that possible yeah that's one of the things that particularly shocked me which actually i wasn't clear about till recently is that even though accreditation standards are minimal and as you say it's kind of in-house monitoring the organization that administers it is also doing the monitoring uh, clinics can continue to operate legally when they don't meet any of the minimal standards for accreditation so that, there are a number of unaccredited ECT clinics still operating that's that's correct they cannot meet the criteria and then and and still carry on doing it and and yeah. and in addition uh, about 20 percent of the units around the country um, don't bother with the accreditation process at all. No, so it's just a, it's, it's a voluntary, it's a voluntary thing. And if you don't meet the criteria, you carry on anyway. I don't think they've disaccredited anybody, to my to my knowledge, um, or if they have, it's very few. I think they haven't yeah. done anyone at all. So, so, so it's an extraordinary so, state of affairs, even if you think it has a place, which is partly yeah. why you've been part of a campaign group, which I'm also part of. Yeah. Once again, try and you know bring some of this to public attention and tell us a little bit about the campaign and how it's going and what 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 are, what are its main aims. What, what yeah, I've been involved with a few now over the years in several in several countries, but I'm actually quite hopeful this time. Something something different is going on at, at the minute. I think part of what's happening is it's a coalition of um, different types of people in, involved. So there are ECT recipients or survivors, as some of them like to be, prefer to be called, and their family members. Um, there's academics like myself, there's clinicians like yourself, uh, you're also an academic, of course, but, um, and uh, including some psychiatrists. Uh, and, and we're calling for um, a sort of Cumberledge style independent inquiry because there's lots of parallels to what went on with the, the mesh situation with, with governments and professional bodies just not listening um, to patients repeatedly saying the same thing about the damage being being done um, so we are calling for that inquiry that sort of independent inquiry and that's already been backed by a number of key mental health organizations uh, including the association of clinical psychologists the national council national Counseling Society, um, Headway, the Brain Injury Association, which is very important to have them on board because that's fine, you know, a real acknowledgement that this does cause does brain injury. Because a, a brain injury is not sign up for something um, that, did, um, that didn't brain injury. Brain injury. Um, and um, then, of course, we've got the largest uh, mind, John, don't mental health charity. Yes, the largest mental health charity, Mind, which is which is widely respected. Um, and by no means a sort of a radical anti-psychiatry group at all. Uh, works with the government on, on lots of lots of issues. So really, quite a uh, an important mainstream and certainly the largest mental health charity. Um, uh, also endorsing our our call for an independent. And just for people who may not be familiar with this, the Cumbridge Review. I mean, it's a UK yeah. thing. Um, but there's been recently an independent government inquiry into the use of pelvic meshes among a few other medical procedures and it's found all sorts of horrendous you know harm and damage caused by pelvic meshes which have been used in ways that aren't evidenced and haven't been monitored and people's complaints have been ignored and so on mm. and because of that it appears there's going to be um, an all parliamentary party group setting up set up to look at other examples of, of of bad practice so it seems like a timely moment to say we've looked into pelvic meshes how about ECT? Yes I mean there's the parallels are quite clear aren't they? The, yeah. the, the repeated uh, the, the times that governments and professional bodies just ignored patients um, however many times they said the same thing over and over and over again and yeah. that's exactly what's happened with, with shock therapy so we have a and we have a number of of key, very, very um, determined uh, ECT survivors campaigning alongside us who have been at this, uh, certainly as long as you and I, Lucy, some, uh, Dr. Sue Canliffe, for instance, who's a, who was a paediatrician until she had ECT and then could not continue with her, yeah. um, her work because of that, um, and, and, and many others um, who have been battling away, sometimes by themselves. So we've all come together now and I, I'm not, um, as some of you will know, I'm not particularly optimistic 
person uh, around changing some of the worst habits of psychiatry, but I, I, I feel the time is right. Um, and um, there's lots of things that people can do to, to help. I mean, we, we, there will be a petition up and running in the next uh, few weeks that we, people can keep an eye out for, an official government petition yeah. according to this inquiry. But in the meantime, people can write to their MPs because um, we have already sent, uh, 40 of us, sent a letter to Matt Hancock, which sadly has been met with the usual sort of, um, exactly the same sort of thing that happened with the uh, mesh situation. Um, it's just a fob off. Um, mm. And that's not going to be good enough. We're not going to go away. Um, mm. So we would need people to write to their MPs and to, um, what's her name, Liz? Is it Nadine Dorries, the, the mental health and suicide? Yes, that's right. The current Minister for Mental Health. Mental Health and Suicide. Yes, but we're not letting it go at that. Yeah. So, um, yes, we really would like everybody to, to get involved. Please please write to your MP and get them aware of the situation um, and the need for this independent inquiry. There's going to be a link. Please do that. And also, I mean, there's a number of, perhaps we should mention the legal aspect as well, legal cases, because this is another new thing, isn't it? We're kind of pushing in various directions. Yes, in, in some ways, this might be the most important thing. And, and I say that because uh, research doesn't always uh, change very much. It doesn't always change uh, the world, does it? Very it doesn't. You, just have to, you have to produce it anyway to prove that there's a case. And as, as a professor, I have to say research is very, very important. But, <laughs> but... I think what might be more important is, is getting some people in court. Yeah. And um, Freeth, uh, the uh, law firm Freeth, are starting a class action suit. And they already, as a result of the publicity we got from our review, and they've had dozens of cases lined up and they're coming in all the time. And they are going not for the fact that it causes brain damage and memory loss, but for the fact that people are not told about mm -hmm. that and that is a breach of the ethical principle and in fact it's illegal also uh, the ethical principle of informed consent which is an absolute sacrosanct part of the ethical code of all uh, medical professionals and mental health professionals which is broken on a regular basis mm -hmm. uh, almost every time anybody has ECT you can pretty much guarantee that they breached informed consent because no <clears throat> no psychiatrist, as I'm aware of, ever tells people that you have a 50% chance, up to a 50% chance, of getting permanent brain damage. Um, so that's, that's also, uh, yes, yeah, so you're right, it's a very important part of the, of the campaign or, or, or the process to, I think, if for me, eventually the goal is indeed to um, have ECT um, fade away like lobotomies did. I don't think they're going to go by legislation or banning them. I mean, the botanists weren't banned. People just stopped doing it because yeah. it, because they were eventually embarrassed and eventually accepted the pressure from patients and other professionals. Thank you. That's a great summary. And anybody who wants to get involved, follow the links. You'll find articles that appeared in the press. You'll find John's most recent review. You'll find a draft letter you can write to your MP. And... Uh, as you say, we're optimistic. This could be a breakthrough, could be the breakthrough we've finally, finally been waiting for. So. I, I, I think so. And let's remember that the majority of psychiatrists never, ever use ECT. Well, it's interesting. It's important. Psychiatrists have supported our campaign. That's Indeed. Indeed, they have. So thank you for telling us all about it. Okay. Thanks, Lucy. See you, everyone. <laughs>